Okay, hi everyone, welcome to this week's ESRG seminar. Before we begin, I'll just give a quick overview of the structure of the seminar. So we'll have a talk for around 40 minutes uh, with time for questions at the end. And just so you know, this talk is being recorded and live streamed to YouTube. Uh, to ask questions at the end, if you if you on the Zoom chat, please raise your hand or type your question in the in the chat, and we'll ask it for you. And also, if you're watching on YouTube, please type your que any questions in the chat, and we will ask them on your behalf. So today we're really excited to have our seminar from Jeff Kilger, who's in New Zealand at eleven at night for him now. So I'll hand you over to David, who is going to introduce our speaker for the day. Okay, thank you, Caitlin. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Jeff Gilgo to you today, this fine morning. Um, Jeff completed his BSc and MSc at Waikato University, New Zealand, with a master's thesis on rhyolite eruption dynamics. Then he started working as a volcanology technician at GNS Science, largely working on geothermal geology characterization for newly developing geothermal fields in Tapu Volcanic Zone. As the geothermal work began to diminish, Rapea erupted in 2007, providing a chance to get back to proper volcanic rocks that weren't altered by nasty acidic fluids. He then completed his PhD at Bristol, working on magmatic processes and rheology of Rapea magmas. It was there he, that he was lucky enough to meet the wonderful Janine, who forced him to learn about the joys of gelatin. Since returning to GNS science, he worked has largely focused on White Island and Rapea along with scientific responses to Ambea, Venatu, and more largely Hunga Tonga. Sorry for the pronunciation there. <laughs> so thank you very much, Jeff, for agreeing to do this with us. And I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks, David, for that uh, fantastic introduction. Uh, so hopefully uh, you'll be able to see my screen um, and I'll just get going. Uh, because as um, it's been mentioned, it's 11 o'clock here, so I'll uh, try and wrap up before midnight. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, uh, White Island. It's a particularly interesting volcano for a number of reasons. I'll get into why um, straight away, actually. So um, this is a photo from, I'm just going to put my laser pointer on. Uh, this is a photo from the April 2016 eruption of White Island. And uh, one of the interesting aspects of this eruption was that it was um, preceded by very little warning. And the day after the eruption, a tour company went out there and, and, and um, uh, conducted a normal tour. And um, the track for the walking um, uh, area where they go up, uh, basically following along here and come back down, uh, that was all covered in uh, newly deposited material. Uh, so clearly there'd been an eruption, a uh, very small one, but still uh, it was effectively a near miss. So, um, so why care about White Island, which is a volcano uh, on the other side of the world, literally? Uh, well, it is New Zealand's most active volcano. Uh, so over the last uh, about 30, 40 years, it's been in a near constant state of unrest, punctuated by uh, quite regular uh, eruptions that have either been largely phreatic, uh, i.e. those steam-driven eruptions, or ones that are, are slightly more magmatic, uh, where scoria has been emitted. Um, there's been a, a number of fatalities from this volcano. Uh, 10 people died after a, a landslide occurred from roughly up here on the crater wall and flowed down. Uh, and that's largely why you see these mounds on the crater floor. Uh, and it basically took out a sulfur mine uh, where 10 people working uh, were working at the time. Uh, it's also a high sulfidation copper and uh, gold ore deposit, basically in the making. And so we can learn a lot about how um, uh, these deposits are formed and the rates in which they can form. Um, the last major eruption was in December of 2019 and 22 people died uh, during that event a particularly sad event for New Zealand and um, investigations are ongoing. So uh, the volcano is um, a small island uh, and it's got a regular steam plume emitting from the volcano 
this is again from 2016 or immediately after. Um, and you can see basically these uh, high crater walls here, uh, which, which uh, form a horseshoe shape, uh, which directs a lot of the uh, erupted material across the crater floor, uh, potentially impacting any people that are on the crater floor at any given time. Uh, but historically, uh, activity goes back to basically the 50s and 60s when visits uh, began in, in, in some uh, scientific context. Uh, and, and, and we can see that the, the, these old images basically show the, the scoria that's laying across the land uh, from recent eruptions. You can see a person there for scale. Uh, uh, you wouldn't do that nowadays, but um, back then it was fine to do so. Uh, and also the, the hydrothermal system has caused quite significant changes through time. So there's a very, very dynamic uh, environment out at Wad Island. So it's, it's certainly worth studying. So why is it there? Well, it's part of uh, New Zealand's rather complicated uh, tectonic setting. Uh, so New Zealand sits astride two um, large um, tectonic plates. The Pacific plate, obviously down here, which is largely oceanic plate, oceanic um, crust, and the Australian plate, which is largely continental crust. So uh, up towards the north here, as we head towards Tonga, uh, we share a, a common um, arc front here, uh, part of the Kermitic Trench and then the Kermitic Arc behind that. Uh, but New Zealand, at, in, in New Zealand, because of this uh, joining of oceanic and continental, and continental crust, we have subduction uh, occurring obliquely here, which then transitions into a transform or strike slip fault, uh, which is causing the Alpine Fault, which is the Southern Alps for New Zealand. And then back here, we have more subduction uh, coming in from the, from the west towards the east, where we have uh, oceanic plate over here, oceanic crust, I should say, and continental crust here. So we've got the full array of subduction, uh, uh, strike slip, and then subduction again, uh, all occurring um, across New Zealand. And that oblique subduction is causing the clockwise rotation of this part of the North Island here, the East Cape, which is then opening up uh, or rifting the arc uh, in a similar way, right from this volcano here, Ruapehu, uh, all the way up uh, past Tonga uh, towards Samoa. And this is the location of White Island that I'll be talking about today. So that's more of a broader context. So the island is a, is a rather small portion of the submerged edifice of the volcano. Uh, and basically this is uh, only a few, uh, well, it's, it's, it's about two kilometers across, uh, but the submerged portion is a little bit larger. It's more like four to five kilometers across. Uh, and when you look closely with the bathymetric data, you can see that there are clearly uh, both um, uh, debris and potentially lava flows that have been emitted from uh, or, or extruded from this um, uh, current location of White Island. So it's, a, it's certainly a submerged volcano, but uh, still a small proportion sits uh, atop of the sea level. And the highest point on the island is here. It's about 320 meters above sea level, just for context. So the island is monitored um, by, the, um, by us at GNS Science as part of the GeoNet project, uh, which is a, a monitoring project looking at uh, active volcanoes, earthquakes, uh, landslides, and tsunami. And on the island, we have uh, three cameras uh, which look towards the vent. The vent is located somewhere in here. Uh, we have two GPS stations and we have two seismoacoustic or seismic stations and uh, two acoustic arrays co-located with those seismic stations. Uh, part of the interesting aspects of this, it's 50 kilometers offshore, so it takes quite a bit to uh, monitor the island and, and, and quite some maintenance. Um, but the other uh, interesting aspect is that it's privately owned. So uh, it's a really odd uh, situation in the New Zealand context, whereas, uh, so someone actually owns a volcano, which is something I've always aspired to. So the activity on the island uh, has been observed uh, right back um, even before the 1800s when indigenous Maori uh, were occupying the uh, Bay of Plenty coastline and were, would see 
uh, steam emissions from the volcano offshore. Uh, but a, probably a, an incomplete um, uh, historical record of eruptions shows that activity really uh, increased uh, right up in, in more of this period here, where uh, uh, this is the, the, the time at which I'll be talking about today, the period between 1976 and the year 2000, which was the last magmatic phase where we have scoria uh, eruptions. So these are some of the images from the volcano, um, but it's worth pointing out that, that almost all of these eruptions, um, no matter what lead up time, um, uh, anything to do with the eruptions, either phreatic or magmatic, but they've all been very, very small, uh, much, much lower than, than 0.01 cubic kilometers. So on the VEI scale, there'd probably be a one, um, maybe etching into a two, but very, very small indeed. Uh, and they occur regularly, as you can see from this timeline. The most recent uh, uh, magmatic phase was in 2000, the year 2000, uh, where we uh, saw or witnessed uh, uh, eruptions emanating from the same uh, vent area that I mentioned before, and scoria was ejected all across the, uh, the crater floor. This is looking to, from the vent uh, towards the coastline, so effectively west to east, uh, where the boats would come in roughly uh, just, just off the picture here. Uh, and you can see the scoria that's been uh, ejected and, and deposited on the crater floor. And it's quite a difficult environment in order to uh, maintain equipment. So if we start getting into uh, some of the aspects of the magmatic system at White Island, uh, we can do some fairly simple um, uh, analysis. So looking at the bulk chemistry of the scoria and some simple petrography. And if we focus on the magmatic phases between 1976 to 2000, we see that almost all of the uh, uh, magmas generating eruptions here have been a medium potassium calcalkaline suite, which is uh, normal for New Zealand uh, arc volcanic rocks. And it's from basaltic andesite to dacite and composition. And that's the bulk uh, composition. And uh, the consistency of that compositional range uh, has really been seen throughout geological history. It's quite difficult to get pristine samples from the island because it's so active and the acid alteration tends to cause some uh, issues when we're looking at bulk chemistry. But we can still see that the, the chemistry has largely stayed the same uh, throughout most of the geological history that we've been able to analyze. The fenocris component is about 20 to 40%, and that's been also fairly steady. And the mineral assemblage uh, for an arc andesite is slightly unusual in that it's uh, plagioclase CPX, OPX with a little bit of olivine, and there are plenty of melt inclusions. So already, even just from that uh, mineral assemblage, you can see that it's not a very wet andesite, andesitic uh, volcano, where we would normally expect either amphibole or some sort of biotite phase. Uh, but here we've, we've essentially got a dry mineral assemblage. So here's some images uh, that we can uh, collect from uh, some of these scoria. Uh, so here I'm focusing on the pyroxenes. Uh, so here's a very nice uh, euhedral uh, OPX in this case. And you can see on the margins there a very clear magnesium rich rim, uh, which is generally uh, uh, presumed to indicate uh, magma recharge from a hotter, um, uh, more magnesium rich magma. Whereas on the right hand side, we have uh, CPX and an OPX here with quite limited uh, um, outer rims, which indicate that not all uh, of the samples uh, across the suite. Uh, and this is just a, a quick snapshot because I can't show it all. Uh, but there's quite some variability in the, um, in the rims of these crystals. And in some cases, we might be able to see multiple MG rich rims. The other thing that's uh, rather interesting uh, in terms of the mineral assemblage is the olivine. So olivine shouldn't really be in equilibrium for an andesitic or even a dacitic melt uh, magma. And so uh, when we look at the olivine phenocrysts within these 1976 to 2000 suite, we see that the olivines in various stages of resorption, some quite unhappy ones uh, and others which are you know, on the order of breaking down. But in, in, in other cases, and probably more the extreme case, we see olivines here, quite euhedral olivines, although they're starting to show a little bit of breakdown, but they're actually jacketed by some uh, mafic melt 
So that basaltic melt, the lighter gray in this uh, BSE image, uh, by the way, the uh, scale bar is 100 microns. Uh, this is a basaltic melt largely surrounding that um, uh, olivine crystal. Whereas in other more later phases of the eruption sequence, we can see almost complete breakdown, uh, variable breakdown. And, and, and in this case, we see magnesium rich rims on these um, CPX in that case. And then olivines here, which are looking uh, actually quite pristine and uh, not breaking down completely. So we have olivine present uh, right up until 1993 in this episode, but we don't see it in the later uh, eruptions in 1999 and in 2000. So the other aspect of the olivine that we can simply do is with uh, microprobe data, we can characterize the four strike content. And uh, if you just uh, cast your eye down to the uh, x-axis here, these are very, very high phosphoritic uh, olivines. Uh, and these are the cores, the, the, the filled squares, and these are the rims here, uh, the open squares. And in this sample, uh, where we have the relatively tight range between the cores and the rims. This is from that same sample where we saw that basaltic melt jacketing that uh, olivine crystal. There's certainly more to do on this, but uh, simply put, these appear to be mantle derived um, olivines and therefore the basalt carrying it uh, is almost certainly mantle derived. So in this case, the uh, crystal boundary the crust mantle boundary in around the what Island edifice is around 20 to 25 kilometers depth. So the melt inclusions that we've analyzed uh, are unusually dry. Uh, an anesthetic um, uh, system, uh, especially in an arc, would normally have water contents uh, somewhere between four and probably about six or seven weight percent water. Here we have uh, on the order of half a weight percent water. So these are almost certainly uh, some of the driest magmas, uh, driest arc magmas that have ever been analyzed. And these are data from um, some previous work and then some of our hygrometry work here, which is indicating slightly higher water contents and potentially dehydration at relatively shallow depths. So just to um, uh, explain that the 250 MPA up here is probably on the maximum. That's around nine to 10 kilometers deep and uh, 50 MPA is uh, around about a kilometer, kilometer and a half, something like that. So the other thing uh, to characterize these samples is to look at the mineral melt equilibria and the temperatures of these magmas on eruption. And these are very, very high, again, in, in concert with the very, very dry assemblage at White Island. These are very, very high arc andesites. Uh, so the basaltic component uh, which uh, these are the olivine melt equilibria here. These are close to 1200 degrees, whereas the rest are somewhere between 1000 and 1100 degrees, roughly, or more broadly, probably 950 to 1100 degrees. So very, very hot um, arc andesites. And this is consistent, again, with a dry um, magmatic system. So based on these data, uh, these data alone, uh, we came up with a, a, a kind of conceptual model of what we think in terms of the magmatic system underneath the volcano. And uh, we, we, if we think that there's a kind of um, shallow storage system somewhere between one and two kilometers deep, probably around one kilometer, um, largely filled with um, andesitic uh, magmas surrounded in, in some sort of crystal mush zone. Whereas uh, basaltic injections at around 1200 degrees come into the system, probably at the base, and then intrude their way or find their way to interact with the resonant magma uh, to erupt as what we've seen from the samples we've looked at from 1976 to 2000. So I'm gonna, so this is a new model um, and it was published last year, uh, but kind of interesting to look at what people had done before. So this is uh, the previous model, uh, which was largely based on um, mineral compositions, but there was no geothermal, real geothermometry, nor was there much in the way of geobarometry. Yet, uh, it was a largely a, somewhat of a guess 
as to where this depth uh, would, um, where you'd find it some sort of magma system or magma reservoir, in this case, magma chamber. But here we see um, uh, effectively a dike uh, with some storage about a kilometer below surface. Uh, so that's remarkably similar to what we've come up with, yet we've come at it from quite different uh, ways and in using slightly more modern techniques. But I think that's really an interesting case of how uh, some older data can still provide uh, useful um, estimates of magmatic systems. So the implications of this are quite significant. Um, what we do see when we're monitoring uh, in terms of seismicity I'll just jump to this bottom point here, is that we see a uh, very long period earthquakes. And these are generally related to gas release events. And when we do some back projection of where those uh, VLP sources are, they generally converge at about a kilometer deep. And that seems to coincide with the top of the magmatic system that we've derived and uh, Jim Cole and others had derived back in 2000. And so that seems to be the source of uh, magmatic gas release, which is possibly some, some reason why, or, or, or some um, explanation for why we've got still quite significant degassing occurring at White Island over a very long period of time and a relatively high SO2 flux and presumably a very high uh, um, H2O flux. So if we sh shift gears, one of the things that, that really took my eye, and I think it probably would take many people's eye, is this texture that we see uh, with this olivine and the basalt surrounding it. So if we just explore that a little bit more, we can then start to get maybe a bit of nuance to that magmatic system drawing or conceptual model that I've just shown you. So just to go back, this is a, a medium potassium alkaline suite. But when we look at the glass compositions, we see these uh, very high magnesium content glasses, very low uh, potassium, and quite low uh, silica content glasses. So these basaltic glasses, uh, particularly from this August uh, 1977 eruption, are very, very clearly distinct from the rest of the uh, glasses in the scoria that we've analyzed. And that's a really stark reminder that in that um, uh, mingled uh, um, SEM image that you saw, these are the glass analyses from those uh, basaltic components. So what uh, Celine Mandon did was she looked at some, just, just going towards some of this magma mixing and looking at what uh, she saw and what I'd seen as well, quite separately, is that those, those orthoporoxines and CPXs uh, are jacketed with this outermost rim, which is high in magnesium. And so Celine basically had a look at these and started to uh, look at the diffusion timescales to, to start getting at what the magma interaction timescales might have been. And the indicative timescales from Celine's work uh, published last year, although she doesn't put um, uh, definitive calculations in there, but it's on the order of days to months before eruption. So in this case, uh, and, and this is throughout the eruption sequence, there appears to be uh, injections of magma at various times throughout the 76 to 2000 period. And they're occurring on the order of weeks to probably days to months um, prior to eruption. So that shows it's a very active open system that's being supplied uh, by hotter, um, uh, presumably sometimes basaltic magma uh, to reinvigorate that system. So if I take this a little bit further, I, uh, in my time at Bristol, uh, and the top right image there is of the magnificent Ben Buse, who uh, I owe a lot of time to for uh, having the patience to show me how to use the probe and the SEM and things. But here's just a, a quick, uh, a, well, a relatively small image of the complexity of magma mingling that's going on here. And if we zoom in a little bit closer, we, we start to see some very convoluted uh, uh, textures here. And if we zoom in just to this little point here, we can see uh, stringers of, in this case, this darker material is the more dacitic glass, whereas the lighter material here is the basaltic glass. But there's very, very complex uh, um, mixing going on here or mingling going on here. And these here are plagioclase crystals. 
These are pyroxene, uh, very, very small microlites starting to grow. But generally speaking, you can see that, that while there are basaltic melts coming in contact with dacitic melts, they're not quenching and they're not crystallizing much particularly at all. And so these are two magmas that are happening, are coming together very, very quickly uh, and not crystallizing one versus the other. Very, very interesting. So we clearly see these, uh, the, the, this mingling texture and, and backscatter electron images. They're nearly microlite free. The mingling is chaotic and the crystal shapes vary from this swallowtail kind of uh, uh, very, very short, uh, quick growth to somewhat euhedral growth. Uh, so really quite complex. So if we start looking at diffusion timescales, when we use major element chemistry, the diffusion timescales are, are really limited depending on what you're aiming at. But if we're looking at things that are really well classified, or, or yes, classified, it's generally on, in this case, it would be magnesium, iron, and other things like that. But the diffusion timescales are really relatively slow. And I was looking to see if these were happening on a very, very fast timescale. So we start looking uh, at using some overseas labs. And in Japan and Hokkaido, they have this amazing um, uh, SIMS machine that effectively allows you to take a 50 micron by 50 micron square and, 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 and analyze or do a, a quantitative map of all of the different elements and isotopes within that area, depending on what you've tuned it towards. So we basically took these uh, mingled textures and made some maps of these various different areas, looking at different complexity. So here we're looking at a relatively simple uh, uh, area or simple boundary, whereas in others, we're looking at much more complicated areas in here and in here and in here. And then we start looking at what they're really telling us in terms of their, their uh, different uh, volatile elements to try and get the very short timescales that might be uh, able to be quantified uh, from this mingled texture. So here are just the BSE images. So if I go back, uh, you can see these are color coded. And this is thanks to uh, Charlene Lemond uh, for doing uh, such a wonderful job with some of this image processing. Uh, but I'll basically take you through, these are different elements here. So chlorine, fluorine, and sulfur. And chlorine and fluorine is reasonably well uh, characterized. Uh, still, there's probably more experiments to be done on the, the diffusivities at different temperatures and compositions. But these are the maps, the elemental maps for chlorine, fluorine, and sulfur. And so even though this BSE images, uh, image is effectively pulling out uh, relative amounts of things like magnesium and iron, uh, you can see that even in chlorine, there's quite a lot of complexity going on here. It's not homogeneous. Here in the fluorine, it's, it's largely devoid in, the, in, this, in this portion. And here, the sulfur is much more concentrated. So we're keeping the same, the same kind of, I don't know, uh, a rotated mouse shape, uh, even through these different uh, uh, elements that we're looking at, these volatile elements. So in this case, the, the other complicated factor around here is that we're not only seeing uh, normal downhill diffusion, so higher concentration to lower concentration across the boundary, but we're also seeing uphill diffusion. And this has been seen on some chaotic mixing experiments done at uh, largely the Munich lab, uh, where they've uh, forced two uh, distinct melts together and stirred that up. And they've seen uh, different elements showing uphill diffusion, other, other ones, and that's due to activity of these different elements and downhill diffusion, which is the normal. And here we're basically seeing a combination of both. So in some cases, we're seeing uphill diffusion of certain elements, but in other times we're seeing downhill diffusion. So this is a very, very complicated system. Uh, I don't quite know all the answers to this and I'm, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments at the end of this, uh, but this is some work we're trying to publish uh, imminently. So, Despite the, the fact that there might be uphill or downhill diffusion, we can still use the characteristic diffusion length scale to determine a time scale if we know the diffusivities of certain elements. So here we've done some uh, profiles across these boundaries uh, using chlorine and fluorine because these are reasonably well characterized as I mentioned before. And what eventually we come out with are time scales in the order of 
seconds, depending on the temperature at which you use. Now, bear in mind, we're mixing a 1200 degree basaltic melt with around about a thousand degree uh, dacitic melt. Uh, so irrespective of the temperature you use, we're still looking on the order of only a few seconds. And so this, uh, and this is both uh, consistent between chlorine and fluorine. And this is across a range of different uh, boundaries that we've looked at. So this diffusion time scale uh, at less than uh, largely, less than a few hundreds of seconds or a few tens of seconds, I should say, at around uh, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 degrees indicates that this is synerruptive uh, uh, mixing. So just to summarize uh, briefly on this, uh, the chaotic mixing we're seeing is showing uphill and downhill diffusion. There's generally a lack of microlites. So there's no crystallization on the boundary between these two because of quenching, excuse me. And it's, it really implies to us that there are two relatively dry, high temperature magmas coming into contact and they're really not able to, to, uh, to quench uh, one on the other, it's, it's especially the more mafic magma able to quench on the other. The short time scales indicate synerruptive mixing. Uh, the viscosity is probably a major factor here because there's, there's a reasonable uh, viscosity contrast between these two magmas, between these two melts, I should say. And in this case, uh, the mixing is almost continuous. So what we think is the mixing has occurred all the way from uh, probably uh, at least nine kilometers depth at the base of the, the main andesitic reservoir all the way through to the surface and, and pass through that kind of staging zone at around one to two kilometers depth. So uh, just to wrap it all up because uh, we're getting close to time here, uh, White Island is probably one of the driest arc magmas in the world. Uh, it's a very high temperature andesite magma and it drives regular but small volume eruptions. Uh, this, this probably also uh, is not just confined to magmatic eruptions, but also the phreatic eruptions that we're also seeing. So the amount of uh, the, 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 these high temperature magmas, which are able to stall at relatively shallow depth, probably feeds a lot of gas into the shallower hydrothermal system, which then pressurizes and then is part of the cause for the frequent phreatic eruptions that we're seeing over recent historical past. Show the, um, the shallow storage region up to about kilometers beneath the volcano is probably where magma degasses and dehydrates. And that's shown from what we saw in terms of the melt inclusion, uh, water contents versus the uh, plagioclase hygrometry. There's about one weight percent water differential between those two. And that's probably indicating uh, where that, um, and that amount of degassing and over a very uh, shallow storage area. Um, as I said uh, just before, the shallow storage may enhance some of these small regular eruptions, and it might preclude um, uh, much larger eruptions from uh, building up or magmatic buildup uh, to drive much larger events. What we think based on these data is that, that we've got mantle derived basaltic magma periodically ascending. Um, and uh, this is one of the extreme examples of uh, an open system uh, open magmatic system where basically you've got a, almost a true connection between the, the mantle and the shallow, very, very shallow uh, magma reservoir. And I think this is probably something that we can do a bit more work on, but I think there's probably a better way of explaining it than blobs. But I think there are uh, masses of basaltic magma that are rising within a, an andesite filled conduit, and that's starting to break up but it's unable to do so uh, in the samples that we see all the way up until eruption. So there are quite large domains within that scoria that, I, that I've shown where the mi mixing textures are, are preserved, where I think that's probably a, a blob that started to disaggregate, but there are, there are still uh, some intact basaltic uh, melt uh, there. Uh, and I think that mixes all the way up to, to eruption. So I've tentatively uh, started calling this next paper on the, the timescales here, some sort of magma speed dating, but I think I might leave it at that. Uh, so I want to thank you for listening. Um, I, uh, I hope the weather's good in Liverpool, but I also want to thank uh, a bunch of people. So 
Severin Moon in, in France, Charlene now in Durham, uh, Bruce Christensen, Georg, uh, Bruce is at GNS, uh, Georg and, and Massey, and our Japanese collaborators. And the funding uh, to get me there to Japan uh, has been incredible. So thanks, everyone. Great. I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much, Jeff. Super interesting. <laughs> Great talk. I think uh, the term blob is becoming universal because I've heard it getting bounced around within our labs, to be fair. <laughs> good, good. I like to hear those uh, very scientific terms. <laughs> okay, have we got any questions for Jeff? Uh, we've got Anthony got his hand up. Hi, yeah, we have three questions here. Uh, okay, uh, my first one, sorry, is um, so I'm struggling. Maybe it's my uh, because my misunderstanding of geochemistry or something, but struggling to understand how you can get time diffusion timescales of few seconds and no mixing. Well, still like you know appeal like still profiles that are different, and then the mixing is continuous, as you said. So how, if if it was continually happening, and then you have timescales of few seconds. Shouldn't you have like a flat profile? Yeah, so we would have a, we would have, so the diffusion time scale or, or length scale we're seeing is only on the order of a few microns. So it's, it, it is a very, very sharp boundary, but we can still see in the volatile elements, we can still see a few microns of diffusion uh, length scale. So even though in the, the, I didn't show it, but the major element chemistry shows that these boundaries are are just absolutely perfectly straight. You can't see any diffusion across those boundaries with even with um, uh, the highest um, spatial resolution you can get with, with field emission gun probe. Uh, so we, we did some uh, major element mapping at low uh, voltage to try and reduce the spatial um, resolution. Uh, but we just couldn't see any boundaries uh, that we could realistically. It was just a, it was just a step profile. So there was there was no uh, there were no there were no uh, analyses in between those those two uh, opposing compositions. So I, I think what we see here is is a natural example of what people have shown in terms of magma mingling, uh, and they've generally assumed that these have occurred and much deeper in the in the magmatic system. I think here this is a, a rather odd case where we can constrain those timescales using this volatile data. Hmm. At least I think so. Okay. I think Jan has a question as well. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Hey. You all right? Good. Good, good. Well, good morning. Good night, but yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Um, I also had some question about the, the, the mixing you, you showed us. And before I ask my question, can you remind me what the nature of the eruptive product were that you found these mingling textures? Were they yeah, lava? So they, they were, were they in the ash or in the lavas? Yeah, they were in scoria. So uh, the scoria was generally, uh, it ranged from sort of fist size down to the fine lapilli. Uh, okay. So we just mined our, our storage of, of samples. But there was one bomb um, that, that some of this came from. Uh, so we've got a range from the bomb all the way through to lapilli size. So the reason why I was, saying I was asking about that is, I guess, you know, you talked about, we, are, we have a lot of cases of, of deep magma mixing worldwide. And, and very often we, we don't preserve those small filaments you're showing. We tend to have larger blobs or, or the, what Ben Kennedy and I used to call the chillers and the blobs, depending how diffuse the boundary is between those rocks. And, uh, but what you show is it, it's much smaller scale. And I will send you some, some photos or, and some papers we, we find exactly those textures in pseudotacolite, in volcanic pseudotacolites. So when we have frictional melting, because the amount of heat coming in the system is so rapid, individual element, so the melting is selective, and then we end up with these filaments very much like those you showed. And, and of course, as a result of, of this selective melting, then you have some filaments which will have chemistry that are often very close to a pyroxene, actual individual crystal, very close to pyroxene or, or, or to plagioclase or olivine, depending on which minerals are melting. And interestingly within those, then sometime you can actually see that a, one of these melt filaments can actually be say, you, you could do stoichiometry to come up to the fact that it's like 70% plagioclase, 30% pyroxene or something like that. 
Um, I'll send you those. They're very, very similar to what you have. Arguably, we have those both in the field and in, in experiments when we run experiments. And again, it's very similar to, to, to your problem in the sense that we're also dealing with once these are happen, happening, it's really high temperature at that point. So then the cooling is very rapid. We quench these textures that you. So unless you keep the system at say 950 or 1000 degrees for a long time, then they won't homogenize. And then we preserve those beautiful, very sharp boundary filaments like those you have. So, which is why I was asking you about the origin of the samples from which you, you got this, because if it was in a dome, we've seen those in domes and shear zones. We've seen domes, uh, these as well in ash erupted. And sometimes you can see the filaments coming out, squirting out of, of a mineral quite literally, um, or between other minerals. It's, it's quite interesting. But yeah, it made me think a little bit as to whether there's other processes of shear or rapid heat input that could also contribute to that, or, or maybe not at all anyway. Um, but it's very shallow really nonetheless, right? It's very, very mm -hmm. shallow what you're dealing with. And obviously at these shallow depth, like you say, it's very dry. So your magma is, it's not really, uh, doesn't really want to mix, right? It says in a mingled state, in a physical state, as you're showing. So it might contribute to that somehow, the sheer history. Yeah, I think uh, the historical observations at the time uh, would see, uh, it's like a, a kind of a deep lava lake that they would call it, and that they would see uh, incandescence even during the day um, in the vent area. So um, I don't think there was necessarily a dome that, that it built, but I, but it, yeah, it's a really interesting point you make. And so I'll, I'll be keen to, to follow that up. I'll, yeah. I'll send you a few papers just to consider. Uh, mm. The other question I had is a bit different. Obviously you show that the, 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 with the barometry, you suggest the, the magma is essentially sitting within the edifice. You know, mm. like the old model of Jim was suggesting like it was sitting at the decolmand at the base between the, the edifice and, and the cross. But you're showing it's about a kilometer above, arguably. So, do you think that was a big contribution to the uh, to the collapse of the and formation of the amphitheater? And if so, if there's more magma down there, I mean, arguably the rest of the structure would be pretty unstable and ready to go. Yeah, that, 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 yeah, I don't know about the stability of the uh, of the amphitheater. I mean, that's that's a it's a possibility. I don't know. Um, um, I think there's certainly more work that we can do in terms of uh, trying to, because we're, we're trying to start using a bit more of the gas geochemistry also to see if we can start to, to pick away a little bit more at some of these, um, you know, the, the interaction between the hydrothermal system and the magmatic system. And so Bruce Christensen would show uh, magma rising to uh, only a few hundreds of meters uh, interacting with the hydrothermal system. Uh, and that may be true, but I think the, the interesting thing about the VLP signal is that that might be corroborating where we're seeing the top of the magmatic system. And I'm not sure what the implications necessarily for, yeah, uh, um, for, for failure, but yeah, it's an interesting point. Yeah, I'll try to dig out. Uh, uh, that reminds me, I really need to finish a paper on White Island. Uh, so we have done a lot of rock mechanic on, on those and looking at the, uh, the, the change from brittle to ductile transition and what at what point do these rocks become compactant and also if you heat them up then a lot of the uh, the clays and the phyllosilicate would just essentially boil off and then it leads to a lot of porosity so a lot of these rocks are very weak around one one and a half kilometer from what mm. I recall so I'll double check those as well so it might actually align the that ductility of the rocks that we find in the edifice at least might align with the depths you have from, from recollection. Yeah, it's an, I think it's an interesting physical problem as to why why are we getting magmas ponding at that depth? Um, I, it may be simply because they're undersaturated and then they're rising to the point at which they're saturating. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. Thanks for answering your question. Thanks, man. I'll get back to you. Take good care. Yeah, cool. Good night. Thank you very much, guys. We have a question from Janine. Hey, yeah, um, thanks, Jeff. That was a really fantastic talk and um, really interesting to, to hear about your work. And um, so I guess I have a bit of some basic questions, really. I, I guess it's, I wondered, like, where does the magma water interaction come into play? Is that is that really very late and um, all the triggering is actually very deep from the, the uh, basaltic magma coming in and sort of shaking things up rather than 
being things which are, are more shallow. I, I just wondered, yeah, where the, the magma water interaction comes into the, the story. Yeah, there's, um, despite it being an island, there's not a huge, um, well, it doesn't appear to be that seawater is, is infiltrating significantly into the hydrothermal system. Uh, there's certainly a signal from uh, meteoric waters and um, there is a crater lake um, uh, here, um, which, you, which you can kind of see. It's just steaming away there. Uh, there's a crater lake that's normally there. It's hyperacidic. It's usually a negative pH. And so that's uh, normally quite a, quite a large amount of head uh, pressure uh, of water pushing down potentially into the hydrothermal system. But there doesn't appear to be a huge amount of magma water interaction at very, very shallow depth to generate uh, some of these eruptions. And although it's worth pointing out that, that during this 1976 to 2000 period, there were periods of freatic magmatic activity, but they were very, very small. Uh, so there were magmatic strombolian phases uh, interspersed by some uh, freatic magmatic phases. And that's thought to be uh, some of the hydrothermal system permeating back into, and towards the magmatic system. But yeah, there's, there's not a huge amount of magma water interaction, certainly now, uh, mm -hmm. nor that what we've seen, uh, even in 2000, we didn't see any. Yeah, interesting. And, and, and I guess so the, the other thing I wanted to ask about was the sort of much deeper parts of the system. And you sort of showed the, the petro um, petrology um, evidence for what's going down there. I wondered, is that matching quite well with uh, geophysical information as well? Um, like how much is known about the deeper, deeper part of the system and how it connects to the shallow other than through petrology? <laughs> yeah, if, if anyone does, um, if anyone's a geophysicist here, they'll, they'll know that... Um, an island is a really horrible place to do geophysics. So, uh, but there is a project uh, that we're aiming that's that got funded not too long ago, uh, but it's looking at this volcano and um, Mare Island, Tahua, which is another island, uh, another odd island. Uh, and it's, it's really an investigation of, of what their likely uh, tsunami genic potential is for the, the eastern uh, side of New Zealand, North Island. And as part of that, they're going to do a whole bunch of geophysics. So uh, marine MT, so magnetotellurics. So they're going to look effectively at the conductivity structure of the of the crust. And um, using the petrology data, they can tune kind of how they build their their MT array, mm -hmm. as well as their their ocean bottom seismometer network that they'll put be, be putting out. So it's hoped that there will be more data uh, coming in line. Um, but there really isn't any um, seismics or MT or any other conductivity. This is a really, really nasty uh, hydrothermal fluids, uh, really, really uh, conductive. So any conductivity measurements uh, just get swamped by the very shallow structure. Uh, so we can't really see probably more than about a couple of hundred meters below the surface. The other thing is that the deformation signal that we've been seeing uh, prior to uh, certain eruptions is largely uh, uh, difficult because the vent is somewhere back here and there's a crater lake here and an inaccessible area all the way back here. And even our uh, GPS station, which is uh, down here and another one way up here, even when we've done leveling across that crater floor, we barely see any um, inflation prior to eruptions uh, right around that, um, that crater lake edge. So it appears as though deformation is also really quite shallow and focused largely in the hydrothermal, hydrothermal system, sort of somewhere between a few hundred meters and maybe six or 700 meters. So that more implies that any magmatic gases that are being released and, and pressurizing above is really being confined to that complex hydrothermal system rather than uh, us seeing even an INSA or anything else, we don't see a broad deformation signal uh, that would indicate that there's anything uh, a kilometer or below. And the island is just too small for inside to basically pick up uh, even a kilometre deep uh, processes. Yeah, I guess it, it, it sounds like then the, the petro petrology and petrography and the geochemistry become so much more important because they are sort of, you know, one of the, the best kind of data sets that you do actually have. Um, and yeah, yeah. As you really said, it's being one. used yeah. to help interpret other data too. So it's a really, really nice showcase for, for why it's so important to do the petrography and the geochemistry. Yeah, wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. <laughs>
All right, I'll put my hand down now. <laughs> okay. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, very, thank you very much, everyone, for the questions and Jeff for your answers as well and for your talk. It was really great, interesting topics. Um, I think we'll probably should let you go and get some rest after your full day. <laughs> that's okay. It's my yeah. pleasure. Uh, I have a soft spot for Liverpool because that's uh, my external PhD uh, examiner was from Liverpool. So I got to drive up there and enjoy a rainy day, which I'm sure it's yeah. not today. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure, is it? <laughs> okay, fantastic. Thank right. you very much, Jeff, again. No problem. Really appreciate it. Days. Thank you, you too. See ya. Bye, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye, Jeff. <laughs>